at it. And uh, I believe in being brief, being brilliant, and being gone. And so I'm about to be gone here in just a second. And so I'd like for us to give a very big God bless you to David Pate. He's going to come up, and he's up first in the batter's box. You were saying that pastor was suffering for Jesus in Rome, and I, I just told Tim that wouldn't be the first time that someone suffered for Jesus in Rome, and a little, little while ago, so I didn't, didn't know uh, if that joke would go over, but uh, you can either laugh at it or with it, but either way. Um, but, but no, we, we, are, we are absolutely excited to be here, and, and what we want to uh, talk about today uh, comes from John chapter 8, verse 32. Uh, John chapter 8, verse 32, and it says, You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You know, you can't be set free from the truth that you don't know. You can't be set free from the truth that you don't know. And so all weekend long, we want to just open up the Word of God and speak the truth. We want to open up the Word of God, and we don't want to be picky and choosy and look at the favorite verses that can go on our refrigerator and this and that. I mean, we want to look at the truth that applies to our life every single day. And I want to start today in 2 Timothy. And I want to look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And, and as Tim and I are ministering all weekend long, we're going to be doing a lot of PowerPoint. If you're taking notes, I want to apologize ahead of time. Uh, we may go just a little bit fast through this, so, so just do the best you can uh, with that. But we want to get in your heart as much information as possible to, so that you can leave this weekend fired up and excited to be used by God in this culture. And that's what it's going to be all about all weekend long. But 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And a key word there is all Scripture. Not just the ones that we agree with. Not, not, not just the ones that make our flesh feel good, you know, but, but the ones that, that, that crucify our flesh. All Scripture, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, now we kind of live in a pick-and-choose culture. We kind of live in a pick and choose culture that wants to say, well, you know, this verse, you know, that was for back then, but that's not for today because if it was for today, then I'd have to change. And if I had to change, then I wouldn't be comfortable, you, you know, but, but see, Paul said in 2 Timothy, all scripture, that's what we're talking about, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. See, all Scripture is profitable, and it's not just profitable for church. See, all Scripture is profitable, and it's profitable for Monday, for Tuesday, for Wednesday, for Thursday. See, all Scripture is profitable for how I run my business, for how we operate in our home, how we talk to our kids, how we educate our kids. See, all Scripture is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction. Why? So that the man, the man or the woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. See, what, why was the scripture given? So that we can be complete. So that we can be complete in the Lord. So we can be thoroughly equipped. We live in a culture today where Christians are not as equipped as they should be. We live in a culture today because why? Because we pick and choose the scripture. Because there's some scripture that I don't like that. I may have to change if I read that. So I want to say that that's old and outdated because I don't want it to be in my life. But the key word here is every. The key word here is for every good work. The Bible is not just for what we're doing here this weekend. The Bible, it, it, I, I want to say it like this. The Bible is not a Sunday school lesson. It's a life manual. 
That's what it is. But we've turned the Bible into a Sunday school lesson. All right, well, what are we going to teach the kids? Right, well, let's, let's find something in the Bible to show our kids. You know, what are we going to teach on Sunday? Well, I got to get, that's what this Bible's for. It's for what we're going to preach on Sunday. And yes, the Bible is for what we're to preach on Sunday. But, but the reason we preach on Sunday is so we can learn how to live life on Monday. And so that we can learn how to live life on Tuesday, on Wednesday. See, the Bible is our life manual, and we've got to start opening it and reading it as that. We've got to open it and say, God, what kind of friend should I be hanging around? God, how should I see my boss? They offended me this last week. God, how do you see my boss? How as a Christian should I walk this out? God, how should I see my, my nation? How should I see my community? How should I see politicians? God, how should I see my money? See, the bottom line is the Bible is not a slave. It's for every, every, every good work. And in, in fact, this isn't just something that... that that, that we talk about today, but this is the way our founders of our nation approached the Word of God in founding our nation. Contrary to popular belief, our, the Bible had a lot to do with the founding of our nation. It had a lot to do. And I want to read you just some quotes of some of the guys, the founding fathers. Tim's going to go a lot more in depth here, but I want to just start off and, and, and get going here. But President Andrew Jackson, seventh president of the United States on the $20 bill, uh, he said this, he said, that book, sir, is the rock on which our republic rests. The Bible is the rock on which our republic rests. In fact, President George Washington, first president of the United States, he said, it is, it is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. Now, that's not real popular today. I don't know that we would say it's impossible. In fact, I think that we're trying very, very, very hard to govern the world without God and the Bible. Now, I don't know how that's working, but, but we're trying. And George Washington, probably the most famous founding father, the guy, the first president of the United States said, it's impossible. And here we are, we think it's possible nowadays. We think it's possible. In fact, President Abraham Lincoln, 16th president of the United States, he said this, he said, I believe the Bible is the best gift God has ever given man. All the good from the Savior of the world is communicated to us through this book. Daniel Webster is one of the most famous orders in American history. Daniel Webster is an amazing man. He served in the House and the Senate for almost 30 years. Years, One of the most uh, famous attorneys uh, of all time. Uh, in fact, th there are some stories that talk about when he would argue at the Supreme Court, he's very successful, he'd win a lot of cases at the Supreme Court. There are actual stories to where people found out who they were going to have to go against. Oh, I'm going to have to go against Daniel Webster. There are actually stories where people... They, they bowed out and said, I'm not going to go against them because I know he is going to win. That is how good that he was. But listen to the character of this man. He said, if there is anything in my thoughts or style to commend, the credit is due to my parents for instilling in me the early, uh, uh, early love of scriptures. If we abide by the principles taught in the Bible, our country will go on prospering and to prosper. Now, these are our founders that said this. Now, I know we're told today that they're atheists, agnostics, and deists. But these, this is what, these are actual right. These are what our founders said. Now, listen to what Daniel Webster went on to say. He said, but if we in our posterity neglect its instructions and authority, no man can tell how sudden a catastrophe may overwhelm us and bury all our glory in profound obscurity. He said, the Bible is the key to our nation. In fact, Patrick Henry he was the governor of Virginia at the time of the revolution. He gave the, the, the give me liberty, you know, the famous speech, give me liberty or give me death. He was kind of known as the voice of liberty uh, from that speech. But he said this. He said, the Bible is worth all other books which have ever been printed. The Bible is worth all other books. Ulysses S. Grant, 18th president. He said, the Bible is the sheet anchor of our liberties. It's the anchor of our liberties. It's the anchor of our freedoms. John Quincy Adams, sixth president of the United States, son of John Adams, grew up during the Revolution, one of the biggest advocates against slavery. He said this. He said, so great is my veneration for the Bible that the earlier my children uh, began to read it, the more confident will be my hope that they will prove useful citizens of their country. He said, what makes useful citizens? The Bible. 
the character that it builds in us. The Bible is what makes useful citizens of their country and respectable members of society. I have many years made it a practice to read through the Bible once every year. And if there's one challenge we want to give to you by the end of this weekend, it's going to be to read the Bible. And it's going to be to read the Bible cover to cover every year. Because as we get the Word of God in our hearts, it changes. And not just our favorite scriptures, the whole Word of God. The whole Word of God. Horace Greeley, I want to end with Horace Greeley as we move on. Horace Greeley, he was an abolitionist uh, in the mid-1800s. And he, he fought hard. He helped the movement at the start of the Republican Party. Uh, and for him, it was, he started as an abolitionist party. He said this. This is, this is probably the best quote. He said, it is impossible to enslave mentally or socially a Bible-reading people. The principles of the Bible are the groundwork of human freedom. See, when you remove the Bible, what we're going to start to see is freedom being removed. See, it's when the Bible comes in that freedom happens. Not only spiritual freedom, but absolutely spiritual freedom, but social freedom, freedom, financial freedom. See, the Bible brings about freedom. In fact, the Bible is the key to interpreting reality. If we don't understand the Bible, the bottom line is we don't understand reality. See, whenever we don't know the Bible, whenever we don't have the Bible in our hearts, we don't see life correctly. We just don't quite see life right when you remove the Bible. See, why do we got to get the Bible in our hearts? Because it's the key to understanding reality. And so when you see some people and, and you hear them talking, you think, they're not seeing reality. They're not coming from a foundation of the Word of God. They're not coming from a foundation of the Word of God. And you know, when you look at our culture, I don't care what news station you turn on. You turn on anyone that you want, what are you going to hear 24 hours a day? You're going to hear problems. In fact, you're going to hear five and six people at a time arguing, fighting for airtime to tell you what is going wrong in our culture. And you know, we're having a lot of trouble coming up with the answer. We're having a lot of trouble coming up with the answer. I, we have a problem, and I, I want to take it like this, a simple math problem. Two plus two equals four, and I think it still equals four today. It's it. There's some speculation on what equals what today. But two plus two equals four. And I want, I want to take, this, this is the example of what we've done in our culture. Two plus two equals four, and here's what we've said. We, we, we've said, yeah, you can't use four. You, you can't use four. Four is too exclusive. Uh, four is too exclusive. Here's what we're doing. We're, we're going to take away four. In fact, you can use any number that you want. You just can't use four. You can use nine. You can use ten. You can use three. You can use the, you can use a uh, uh, sixteen squared. You can you can use whatever you want. You just can't use four. The only problem is whatever you put in for two plus two equals four. Whatever you replace four with, the only problem is it won't work. The only problem is it won't work and so we got a lot of people sitting around these news stations we got a lot of people telling us what we ought to do the only problem is none of it works see what we've done in our cultures we've said we got all these problems and god's sitting here and he's like i've already given you the answer god said he's the bible i've already given you the answer and in our culture we've said yeah, yeah, yeah we can't we can't use the bible you can't you can't use the answer you can use anything else you want but you can't use the answer and that's where we're at this is exactly where we're at in our culture. Now, what happens when you say 2 plus 2 equals 4? No, 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 come up with another one. All right, let's get creative here. 2 plus 2 equals, all right, let's get creative. And we all sit around a table and we start getting real creative and complicated. 16 squared times 5, take the square root of that. And, then, and we get real creative and it sounds real complicated, it just won't work. Now, Paul warned us in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, and this is exactly what we've done. Paul said, don't let anyone lead you astray with empty philosophy and high-sounding nonsense that come from humanistic or human thinking from the evil powers of this world and not from Christ. Here's where we're at in our culture. We're all sitting around and we've got all these complicated isms and this and this problem and this issue and this diagnosis. And, th and we're sitting around, we're coming up with all these answers and they're still not working. They're still not working. Now they sound complicated and, and, and this degree and that degree and they said this and they wrote about this and self-help this and all that. And it sounds really good. 
it's just not the answer. It sounds really good. It's just high sounding nonsense. So this is what we do. We sit around, we got all these issues. Let's take the issue of parenting here. Take the issue of parenting. That's my son right there, handsome guy, looks just like his dad. Uh, I don't know, you know, you, you got all kinds of kids in here. I don't know if any, any of you have ever had a strong-willed child. I don't know if you've ever had a strong-willed child. You know, they just tend not to want to listen. They tend to have their own idea. You say this, they say this. It doesn't matter what you say, it's the opposite every time, and they tend to want to do it their own way. Well, see, in our culture, we've had to come up, we've had to come up with a diagnosis for that. There's an actual diagnosis for that. For kids who don't want to do what the teacher says, what the parent says, it is called ODD, and this is not a joke, this is for reals. It, ODD, it's called Oppositional Defiant Disorder. It's a real thing. Oppositional defiant disorder. You can look it up, and when you look up the definition, it talks about not wanting to listen to parents, tend to not like authority, correcting them and telling them what to do, doesn't what. I mean, literally goes down the line. Now, the Bible actually has already discussed this. It's called rebellion. And the Bible has a solution for that that only works every time as you drive it out. And then on the other side of that, you got a great kid. But see, when you remove the Bible, you've got to come up with these long words. See, rebellion's a whole lot easier than oppositional defiant disorder. It's a whole lot easier to define. See, the Bible's already made it simple, but in our culture, we don't want to hear about the Bible. So you take the issue of marriage. Well, who can get married? Well, who can, how can you get married? How many times can you get married? Who can get married? Well, our culture was just whoever. Now, the Bible already said, God said, a man and a woman. And see, the Bible already defined this, but here we are. You remove the answer, and this is what you got. You know, what is that? Is that, well, see, in our culture, well, I don't know, in our culture, well, that's a blob of tissue. No, 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 in Psalms, God said, I knew you, I formed you in your mother's womb. I knew you before everybody else knew you. You were you before everybody else knew. See, the Bible has already defined it, but when you remove the answer, you're sitting around trying to figure out what the answer is. And this is where we're at in our culture. We remove the answer. In education, oh, well, we can't have God in education. We can't have God. We can't be talking about God in education. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. The creator of the world, there is nothing in this world that he did not have a hand in it being here. And so how can we be educated without him being involved? Now, I'm talking to Christians today. Come on, as Christians, if God created the world, how is there anything relevant that we can learn apart from him that he didn't have a hand in? That's like talking about the iPhone. I heard that we're into Apple around here. That, that's like saying the iPhone. That's like saying, okay, now I want you to learn about the iPhone, but you're going to go and get the Samsung manual to learn about the iPhone. See, how are we going to learn about God's creation and it's not from God in his manual? See, that's where we're at. But see, God already defined that. What are we supposed to do with our money? See, oh, the government's supposed to hand our See, the Bible has already defined that. Colossians 2.8 says, don't let anyone lead you astray with empty philosophy and high sounding nonsense. I don't know if you've heard people, but I, I, I wrote down some crazy quotes that I found. People say some crazy things when you don't know what the answer is. If people say some crazy things. In fact, the environment, people looking at the environment, what's going on, what's happening. There was a media mogul billionaire. I mean, guy owns his own TV network. I mean, this guy, I mean, he's a smart guy. He owns his own TV network. He was talking about the environment, and he said, here's what's going to happen. He knows the answer. Here's what's going to happen. He said, not fixing the environment. Now, this was almost 10 years ago that he said this. Not fixing the environment immediately will be catastrophic. We'll be 8 degrees hotter in 10 years. Now, this was 10 years ago that, that he said, almost 10 years ago. Not 10, but 30 or 40 years, and basically none of the crops will grow. Most of the people will have died, and the rest of us will be cannibals. Now, almost 10 years ago, we were told that we would be cannibals. Now, that's a little extreme. That's a little bit high-sounding nonsense. But when we take problems in culture and trying to figure them out without the Bible, that's all we're going to come up with. That's all we're going to come up with. Take an issue uh, uh, of 9-11. We were attacked uh, by terrorists, 9-11. Horrible, horrible deal. In fact, we've been in a war on terror uh, since 9-11, since 2001. Troops fighting war on, tel uh, on terror. A prominent uh, a movie maker was talking about terrorism. And, and I, I, I want you to help me with this one. Help me understand what he was talking about. He said this about terrorism. 
He said, there is no terrorist threat. Now, wait a minute. Yes, there have been horrific acts of terrorism. And yes, there will be acts of terrorism again. But that doesn't mean that there's some kind of massive terroristic threat. I follow. No, I don't follow. <laughs> I, I never heard of so much high-sounding nonsense. What, 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 what are we talking about here? Another man, uh, actually popular political talk show host, uh, was talking, uh, was just talking about the issue of self-defense and different things like that. And um, they were talking about this scenario. It was actually a lady who, this was a very personal story for her because uh, she had something very tragic happen with her family. Her parents were killed and she, you know, they, was, they were unable to defend themselves and this and that. And so she's a you know, real advocate for self-defense. Obviously, this was very personal for her. And she was advocating for it. And this talk show host uh, she, she put out this scenario and she said, now suppose that you and your daughter were walking in the park or, or walking and you've chosen not to, to defend yourself, but somebody just randomly comes up to, you know, to hurt your daughter. In fact, puts a gun to your daughter's head. Wouldn't you hope that someone else, you know, wants to defend and, and, and do? And, you know, very, very good point. And, and here was his response. He said, in all due respect, when you said that if somebody pointed a gun at my daughter, would I hope somebody behind me had a gun? Here's his response. Are you ready for his response? Now, as a parent, what would our response be? Maybe. Maybe. He said, maybe. He said, I'd also want to know how the guy pointing the gun at my daughter got the gun. No, 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 no. That, that's not what you would want to know. I mean, that's not father of the year right there. You know what I'm saying? That's not what you want to know. But see, this is where we're at. High sounding, non it doesn't take Einstein to, to know that that's high sounding nonsense. In fact, 1 Corinthians, Paul said, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Where is the wise person? Where's the teacher of the law? Where's the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? So, so as we look at the problems that we have in our world, as we have removed the answer, as we look at these problems, sometimes we got to just scratch our head and say, what's going on? Sometimes we got to scratch our head. Why are people doing what they're doing, the decisions and the, just the destruction, the thing? But what is the result of removing the answer? What's the result of moving the answer? Well, let's look at marriage and family relationships. Let's look at marriage and family relationships. Let's just take Exodus 20, 14. You must not commit adultery. See, God told us you must not commit adultery. Now, in our culture, here's what we say. That's too exclusive. You, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery. That's too exclusive. We got to be able to live life. We got to be able to experience. We got to be able to just be pe free people doing whatever we want to do. Now, Whenever you remove Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, what are the problems that you have in a culture? Because we're sitting around and we're talking about STDs. We're sitting around in our culture and we're talking about STDs. What's the, oh, well, how, how do we solve it? How do we solve it? God's, guys, I've already given you the manual. God, I, I, I've already given you the manual. If it's within the context of marriage and you're being faithful to your wife, you're going to eliminate stuff like that. But see, we're not going to talk about that. We're not, we've removed the answer. See, we got broken homes. we got kids. I work at a summer camp. We have over 2,000 young people that come through our summer camp. You want to know what one of the number one problems is that I see? Broken homes. Broken homes create broken kids who then need healing. But you know, if we would learn to stay in the confines of marriage, if we would learn to do that, See, infidelity. Now, now, yeah, yeah. See, I, I got to be able to live. I got to be able to experience life. Teen pregnancy. See, these things, if we would understand the word of God. But see, we've removed the answer. And now we have all these problems. The Bible's got the answer. Let's look at an issue like education. You know, we got problems in education. We've got issue in ed education. I love one of the deals right now that we're talking about in schools all across America. Character matters. Character matters. And I agree, character matters. But where does character come from? Why does character matter? See, without God in the Bible, you can't tell a child why character matters. There is no reason for character to matter. Only, uh, only when Jesus Christ comes in your heart are you now the old man's passed away and now the new, and now I'm to have character. But until you get Jesus Christ, until you have the Bible in your life, character don't matter. 
character don't matter. It's a noble cause. But see, we removed the answer. We got cheating in school. We don't want kids to cheat. Well, where does it say you shouldn't cheat? Where does it say, where does that come from? See, we've got bullying. We should not have bullying. But, but where does it say love your neighbor as, as yourself? See, where, where does anti-bullying come from? Because there ain't no reason not to bully unless you've got a higher reason not to bully. Did you know that harassment is now an issue statistically in junior high? Did you know that? Harassment is now an issue. Well, I wonder why when you teach young kids subject matter that Song of Solomon said don't open love till it's time and we're opening love in kindergarten and trying to teach kids saying that they shouldn't be taught and we're wondering why we have... See, we're creating problems. When you remove the answer, you now have created problems. We got disrespected teachers. We got fighting in school. We got... We're, well, we're trying to control the, the cell phone. You can't control from without. You can only control from within. But when you remove that control, you've got problems. We wonder why kids aren't motivated to get good grades. Well, it's only God that gives you the purpose to be all that God has called you to be. Come on, what does the Bible say? Well, the only problem is in 1963, we said we don't want to be talking about the Bible. In 1963, we said the Bible's got to go. Then we went on in 1980, we got rid of the 10 suggestions. I mean, commandments. Seems like suggestions today. And see, when we got rid of the Ten Commandments, do you know what the judge said in the ruling when he got rid of the Ten Commandments? Do you know what he said? It, you know, this was terrible. I mean, he, he was saving our kids. Here's what he said in this ruling. It was Stone versus Graham, 1980. He said, if the posted copies of the Ten Commandments are to have any effect at all, it would be to induce the school children to read, meditate upon, perhaps venerate and obey the commandments. Do you know now today we're trying to get kids to stop doing things that the commandments could be changing their hearts on? That's what we're doing. We're trying to get that. He said that's not a permissible state objective. Well, what is a permissible state objective? To not to teach kids not to kill? Not to teach kids to save themselves from marriage? Not to teach kids to lie? See, Matthew chapter 12. What, what could the Bible do in our schools? Matthew chapter 12. 12 verse 31, love your neighbor as yourself. You think that would help kids in school? What about 2 Corinthians 8, 21? For we're taking pains to do what is right. What if kids are learning every day? To do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of men. What about Matthew 7, 12? Do to others what you would like them to do unto you. Think that'd be a good one for kids to learn in school. But see, we've removed the answer, and now we've got these problems, and we don't know what to do. What about 1 Peter 2, 17? I love this one. Show proper respect to everyone. Well, if we could get that in a young kid's heart, well, bullying wouldn't be a problem. Character would matter to them. But when you remove the source of character, it's tough to put character in them from the outside. Titus 3, 1, remind the people to be subject to the rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good. 2 Timothy 2, 22, boy, if all our young people can get this, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, along with those uh, who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Proverbs 1, 7, See, why do we have trouble academically in schools? Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge. Why do we have a knowledge problem? Why are our ACT scores low? When you remove the answer, when you remove the fear of the Lord, you remove knowledge. See, God, see, God is not mocked. Remember Galatians, you will sow what you reap. God is not mocked. See, God's way works only every time. God's way works only every time. Here's what I want to talk about today. All thoughts have a foundation. Every thought, every thought that you and I have every day, all the time, all thoughts have a foundation. And there are really two foundations that they could be on. It is feelings or principles. It is feelings or principles. Now, used to, principles were the foundation that all of our thoughts rested on, and feelings were kind of the cherry on top. They were kind of the icing to the cake. And so the meat of how we lived our lives in our country was principle. I'm a man of principle. I'm going to parent out of principle. I'm going to love my wife out of principle. See, I'm going to handle my business out of principle. I'm going to serve my pastor and my church out of principle. God's called me here, and I'm going to serve this man of God. He's not perfect, but he's the man of God that I've called. See, I'm going to live by principles and that was the meat of what we lived by and feelings were the dessert see feelings are meant to be the spice of life not the guide to life but today it has switched 
It has switched. And the lens to which that we see all of life is out of feelings. Feelings have become the guide to life. Feelings have to come to, see, I don't love my life, my, my wife anymore. I got to get another one. See, my kids aren't making me happy. Someone else deal with them. My pastor's not making me happy. I'm looking across the street. There's another church. I'm going to try him out. Pastor was talking about itching ears. See, that's where we're at. See, we're not, we're not living by principles anymore. We're living by feelings. And see, in Matthew 16, 23, Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You're a dangerous trap to me. Remember when Jesus did this? Remember when he looked over at Peter? Now, now, why would Jesus call Peter Satan? Is there an uglier name that Jesus could have called Peter? I mean, Satan literally, I mean, Jesus was coming to, to get after Satan. I mean, that was his arch enemy. It was there a better name you could have called him? Now, why did, what, what brought all this on? Well, you remember what happened? Jesus, for the first time, began to tell his disciples about what he came here to do. See, I didn't just come here to heal people. These are all great things. Those were to draw people on me. But I came here to die. And he began to tell his disciples that I'm going to have to die. Now, obviously, if your pastor walked in here, told this congregation, I'm going to have to die, you love your pastor, and you're going to say, no, 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 pastor, not while I'm in this congregation. I got your back. Ain't nobody going to touch you. Who's talking about you, pastor? You just point me in that direction. You tell me, I've, I've got you. Right? I mean, that's how, see, this was Peter right here. Jesus, who, who, who? I got this sword. You want, you want it? I've got, what do you want me to do? I've got this sword. See, here, here, here is, see, G, but Jesus turned to Peter. He said, get away from me, Satan. Now, whoa, whoa, boy, that was, a, in our culture today, we'd be mad at Jesus. That was ugly. That was mean-spirited. Why, how dare you come again? Peter like that. I'm telling you, we'd, we'd have a church split right there over that right there. Half be with Peter, half be with Jesus. You know what I'm saying? And then we would have second Jesus church down the road. And then, you know, Jesus turned to Peter, get away from me, say your danger's trapped to me. Why did he say it? And it's important that we get this because it's the foundation of our weekend. Jesus was trying to teach us something here. He went on to say, he said, Peter, you are seeing things merely from a human point of view and not from God's. Jesus warned us. See, think about everything. Come on, church. Think about everything Jesus did. Think about everything Jesus did. It was from God's point of view. I'm about the will of my Father. It's not my time. This, that, everything he did, he was about God's. It wasn't about him. It wasn't about what he wanted. But in today, today's Christian, is it what he wants or is it what we want maybe a little bit first? See, is it from the principles of the word of God, his will? See, no longer my will be done, but his will? Or is it, you know what, it is his will, except for in this area, I'm going to have to bypass the Bible because what benefits me in this moment right now is this, this is what I'm feeling. Come on. Where are we at? Where are we at? Are we, see, we're seeing things from a human point of view. Now, did Peter have a good heart? Peter had a good heart, but he didn't have a God heart. And there's a difference between having a good heart and a God heart. Well, there's a lot of things in our culture today that gets our heart, isn't there? We got this cause, and, this, and we're championing this cause and this cause. But we better be making sure we're championing God's cause. Because the only cause that matters is God's cause. And we got a lot of good-hearted Christians, just like Peter, that have gotten caught up in the emotion of a group or a this or a that. And there's only one group, and it's God's group. There's only one way, and it is God's way. See, we're either all about Jesus or we're all about me. Remember, remember what Jesus said to his disciples after he got done calling Peter Satan and correcting him? He looked at all of them, and he said this. He said, whoever wants to be my disciples, you better start denying yourself right now. See, this was a little lesson right here. I know, that, see, Peter got all caught up. He got all caught up. But no, 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 don't, don't be having a good heart and being my disciples. You've got to have a God heart. See, as Christians, we've got to live by God's word. I'll give you an example. Tim and I were speaking uh, uh, at, at a church, and, and we were discussing uh, the issue of minimum wage. And, and, you know, anytime you talk about an issue, a feeling comes up, doesn't it? Anytime you talk about, in fact, I put that right up there, and everybody in here had a certain feeling. But we cannot afford to live by feelings. See, we got to say, you know what, God, I like this, I like this, but what does your word say? See, God, what does your word say? In fact, did you know that Jesus talked about minimum wage? 
You know, see, a lot of times we don't know that the Bible discusses an issue because we're not looking for it to discuss an issue. We're not digging for it to discuss an issue. And if pastor doesn't talk about it on Sunday, we don't know it for ourselves because that's the only time we dig. That's the only time we look in the Bible. I'm telling you, our greatest challenge to you all weekend is going to be to eat the meat of the word for yourself. Not to be spoon-fed. See, Paul, Paul told us, he got on to us, didn't he? And he said, why am I having to spoon-feed you? Remember when Paul said that? I want to encourage you to reread that passage. That was the most offensive thing. I read that the other day, and I thought he did not hold back. That was the ugliest thing I've ever heard. But he said, I'm tired of you being spoon-fed. You can't only hear from me. You've got to open the word. Go on, Matthew chapter 20, verse 1. It says, the own, oh, well, it's tough right here. Now, wait a minute. I don't want to read that. Get a Sharpie out. Black that out, right? Get a Sharpie out. Cover that one up. See, we got to pick and choose. No, 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 no. Every good work. Remember, we started out with that. Every good work. But see, we got a lot of Christians. We feel through the issues. We feel through the issues. See, Jesus said the owner has the right to pay what he wants. Now, let's break this down. Verse 13, Jesus said, am I not being unfair to you, friend? Didn't you agree to work for this? Now, it's one thing we're being cheated. Did we agree to work this? Don't we have the right to do what we want with our own money? See, I work in a ministry where my father-in-law is the pastor. Sometimes I need a raise. And he reminds me, when you married my daughter, did you not agree to work for this right here? I feel like I'm working for Uncle Laban right there, you know. Rachel and Leah, and I feel like he's taking the scripture to a whole nother level. Am I not being unfair? And then he throws another verse at me. He throws another verse at me. All right, we'll get to that here in a second. Now, let's talk about minimum wage for a second. What happens? Let's just talk about the practicality of that. Let's remove the script. Let's just talk practically about minimum wage. Let's just, we talked about it. Let's go into it. Whenever you weigh, you raise the wage, what has also to be raised? The price of goods. So did anything really get raised? Now we feel better, don't we? When we get a right, we feel better. Let's think about a restaurant. When the restaurant owner raises his employer, he starts paying employees more money. What does he then do to the menus? Do you notice every time new menus come out? Why did that happen? Why new menus come out? He had to raise the prices. So it feels like we, it feel, doesn't it feel like it? But see, what happened was the employee really didn't benefit from it. But see, so what do we do? So what do we do? We just stuck where we're at? No, that's why Jesus taught us in Matthew 25. That's where my father-in-law gets me. He says, each is paid according to his ability. See, Jesus says, you got to work on your ability. You got to grow. You got to grow. You got to go to a new level. See, as you go to a new level, as you begin to work harder, see, the boss begins to notice and says, they're, they're so good, the person place down the road is about to hire them. I better give them a raise before they leave me because they are so incredible. See, Jesus doesn't want us ever to stay where we're at. See, read the Bible. From cover to cover, Jesus is always challenging us to go to new levels, isn't he? He's always saying, go to a new level. Glory to glory. I've got more for you. But see, we settle where we're at. Instead of, instead of being challenged to grow. In fact, I was talking about this uh, one time a, a, at a church. And, and when, I, when I got done talking about this, a, a lady came up to me and she said, now, she said, I don't agree with what you said. She said, I don't agree with what you said because I know somebody who needs that. I said, I, I, I have no doubt. I said, you show me in the Bible. You help me because I got to live by the word of God. I don't want to. My flesh doesn't want to. There, we all, we all have an area where our flesh don't want to. I said, show me in the word of God. She had no argument but a feeling. See, we've got to live by the principles of the word of God and not by feelings. Thomas Sowell, incredible uh, man, would teach us on the economy. But he said this, and I think it's a great spiritual principle. He said, most thinking stops at stage one. Now, what's stage one? Me. Most thinking stops at stage one. How I feel, how I think, what I want. See, most thinking stops at stage one. Bottom line is feelings have become our guide to life. See, we want to open up tonight by saying the Bible is the key to understanding reality. Now, as you're sitting here, I know what you're thinking. I agree with you, David. The, the world has removed the answer. 
As we're talking about education and homes and kids and this STDs, this, 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 I know you're sitting there, you're going, absolutely, the world has removed the answer. That's exactly what the world has done. Well, I, I want to end here tonight before we, we, we get to Tim and we might take a little dip in quality of speaker. Um, but you got you to get him in while you have the mic because I know he's going to get me back at some point. We like to have fun. Gallup came out with a poll. And it, and, it, and it said this. It said almost 80% of Americans identify as Christians. Now, I want you to sit on that one for just a second. 80% of Americans identify as Christian. Now, wait a minute. That's the majority. That's the majority of Christians. I want you to think about that. 80%? I don't know if you had this reaction like I did, but that was kind of my reaction. 80%? When I look at families and businesses and you watch the same news that I watch, 80%? Really? That's where we're at? That'll make sense to me. That'll make sense. Why? How can that be? That's not true. They're lying. <laughs> they're Christians and they're lying. That's not right. Well, George Barnett came out with a study and he put it all in perspective. He said, whenever you break down the word Christian, what does that mean? And you know what he found out? He found that less than 10% of Americans have a biblical worldview. And there's the difference. We have a lot of people checking the Christian. Are you a Christian? Check. They check the Christian box. But do you have a biblical worldview? What's a biblical worldview? Biblical worldview is I take the Bible, the Word of God, and I ask, God, how am I to live my life? God, here are the friends I'm wanting to have. Are they the kind of friends that you want me to have? God, here's the kind of mate I'm looking for. God, is this the kind of mate that you want me to be looking for? See, God, this is the kind of school I'm looking to send my kids to. God, is this the kind of school that you want? You, you take any issue of life, and the Bible is the lens to which we use life, that we look through life. And, and what George Barnes said is less than 10% of Christians have a biblical worldview. Totally different. That's a whole different level of Christianity. But see, here's what we have in our culture. We have a disconnect. We have a disconnect. We have a disconnect between what it means to be a Christian and what it means to know the Bible. See, we have separated the two terms. And here's what I want you to know. As we start off tonight, Christian doesn't mean biblical anymore. This is the disconnect that we're at. Christian doesn't mean biblical anymore. Are you a Christian? Yes. Do you believe in the Bible? Yeah. See, Christian doesn't, see, Christ followers or a Christian don't have to be biblical today. They, don't, they do not have to be biblical. See, I could be a Christian, but I don't have to believe in the Bible. I definitely don't have to believe in the whole Bible. I only believe in the Bible. Well, what, you, you don't believe in all of it? Well, no, just the parts of it. Who picks the parts? How do you get to pick the parts of which one? But see, here's what's happening. What's happening to those other 90% of Christians is Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Don't copy the behavior that comes to this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. See, the problem is we are getting, we're having salvation, but we're not having that transformation by changing the way that we think. We're conforming to the world. We're conforming to the world. And, and I want to end by looking at this. When you look at, at biblical issues and principles, because this is the kicker. This is why we're at where we're at. This is why we're at where we're at. You take any issues. They did a pastor survey, and they asked pastors, are you a conservative pastor? And that's not meaning political. That's meaning that you believe, you are Bible-believing. You believe the Word of God through and through. It addresses the issues of the day. You are that kind of pastor. They asked them, are you a conservative pastor? And over 400 pastors that they surveyed said, yes, I'm a conservative pastor. What do you believe about the issue of abortion? 97% of the pastor's surveys says, I believe the Bible gives the exact principles on when life begins and what abortion is. I believe with the Bible, 97%. When asked, did you preach on it last year? Of these 97%, here's the difference. Only 40% said, yeah. Now, I believe it, I just don't preach on it. I believe it, I just don't preach it. What are you going to do this next year? 39% said, I'll preach on it this next year. Same-sex marriage, 97%. Here's what the Bible says. 45% have preached on it, 31%. Look at that, a little more controversial. I better stay away from that. I don't want to talk about that. Immigration, 78%. Is immigration an issue in our culture today? Everybody's talking about it. What's the Bible say? See, the Bible, we shouldn't be scared to stay away or scared of what the Bible might say or might not say. 6% said, 6 said they preached on probably the hottest topic this last year. 
10% said preached on it next year. Environment, 96%. 16% preached on it. 11% plan on preaching it. What about self-defense, gun ownership, use? 61% says the Bible addresses it. 4% preached on it. 5%. Is this not a big issue in, in, in our culture today? Government spending, 77 9%. Not applicable. I don't even know if I'm going to preach about government spending uh, uh, this next year. See, this is where we're at. We are called the light of the world. And if the light doesn't have the light, how can we bring the light to the world? Now, 80% said they're a Christian. Why do only 10% have a biblical worldview? Because only 10% of pastors are preaching a biblical worldview. The congregation only knows what the pastor feeds them. The congregation's only motivated by what the pastor feeds feeds them. Daniel chapter 1 verse 3. This is our challenge this weekend, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. See, what is that saying? Daniel resolved, I'm not going to be like the culture. God, whatever you tell me. Hey, if they tell me not to bow down, God, I'm, if you tell me to bow down, I am going to bow down. You remember what Daniel said? Daniel said, please test your servant for 10 days. He said, let me do it God's way, and let's see what the fruit of God's way is. See, God's way only works every time, and you know what? When we're biblical Christians, people start looking at us, and when they start seeing our marriages, they start seeing our kids, they start seeing our homes, they'll start to ask, what do you have? Because you have something that I don't have. See, that's what a biblical Christian looks like. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the other young men. God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. The king found none equal to Daniel. See, Daniel was a biblical Christian, and the king found none equal to Daniel. If we're going to restore the answer here in America, if we're going to restore the answer, we've got to have some Daniel people. We've got to have some Daniel people. See, Daniel people do things God's way. They're, they're people who will stand up when others won't. So we want to motivate you this weekend to stand up when others won't, to do it God's way, no matter what. You know, sometimes it's intimidating doing it God's way. Sometimes it's scary, but you think about everybody God used in the Bible. David did it God's way. Samson, did it God's way for a little while. <laughs> Joseph did it God's way. Daniel did it God's way. The disciples did it God's way. And almost all of them were, were martyred by a martyr's death, but not just in words, in actions. Our pastor challenged us this last year. As a congregation in Hot Springs, Arkansas, we were complaining. because all I don't know how many of you have complained. We're taking God out of Christmas. We're happy holidays and this and that. No, it's Merry Christmas. I don't know if you did what we did, but anytime somebody said happy, happy holidays, we'd always say absolutely Merry Christmas. And, you know, we, we were just, we, we were into it like that. But we were complaining about the nativity scenes being taken down by the courthouse and all this kind of stuff. And our pastor looked at us and he challenged us. He said, whoa, whoa, whoa. now before you start getting it, mad at the world for not bringing Christ to the world, from the world, what are you Christians doing? He challenged us. Do you have a nativity scene up in your yard? Do you have Christmas lights up on your house? He said, if it doesn't start with Christians first, it's not going to go to the world second. Boy, he challenged us. See, as Christians, it's easy to get upset with what's going on in culture. But if we're going to restore the answer, it starts with us. With us. John 8, 32, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's what this weekend is all about. Amen? Pastor? Wow. So good, right? All right, so here's what we're getting ready to do. We're going we're gonna to take a break here uh, in just a few moments, but here's what I want us to do right now. I want us to prepare our hearts to give. You know, one of the things that I love is, is as he's talking, you know, and he's talking about the fact that they're connected to a local church. How many know that's very important? Amen. I don't trust people that don't have a pastor, right? And, 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 and this is a ministry that is, that is, 